Okay, Victoria, thank you. Uh, you know, there is a slide that um you have to share, shared by Marianne earlier, just announcing the webinar. Hello, good morning, Madam. Good morning. So thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, depending yeah. on where you are. Good morning, good afternoon, Madam. Uh, Madam Pinel, uh, International Director of uh, ITB Family Foundation. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Madam Pinal. I request okay. that uh, we put our we put off our microphones. Microphone, yeah. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so, welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, this is the second webinar, and uh, um, we're going to look at uh, lessons learned from scaling accelerated education programs and gas forecast models for out of school children in West Africa. Um, it's a pleasure. For me to be here and to learn. Uh, I think I learned a lot last time during the last webinar and I'm looking forward to an even more engaging webinar this uh, this day, this afternoon. So feel welcome. I'll briefly take us through the agenda for today. Uh, we have a bit of a packed agenda so we'll try to uh, go as fast as we can and we'll also hold off um, questions to the end of the presentations. So uh, we ask that uh, you make use of the chat. We have a chat. You can make use of the chat to ask all any questions and also to make comments. You'll also have an opportunity at the end for you to be able to ask questions. And uh, we really appreciate uh, that you keep your microphones on mute as uh, we go through this. Uh, so for the agenda today, uh, we'll have welcome remarks from Dr. Leslie Kasley, uh, as she's the Director Associate for Change. And then and she'll be talking about uh, scaling strategies that have worked in West Africa using evidence. Then we'll get a keynote speech from, uh, I know there's a problem, thank you. Uh, we'll get a keynote speech from Dr. Awesome. Uh, Director of Social Mobilization, Universal Basic Education, MOE Abuja. And uh, he will be focusing on uh, what have African governments done uh, so far to reduce out of school children and how they have uh, scaled up accelerated education programs. And after that, we'll go into the presentation. We have a panel session. We have three presenters. Uh, the first presenter will be Dr. James Natia. And he'll be talking about uh, Government of Ghana's uh, framework uh, for tackling the rising out of school children. Uh, what are the le lessons learned in scaling up um, complementary basic education, implementation, and financing in Ghana? Uh, after Dr. James, we will have Mr. Bahago, who will be uh, who is the researcher center for the study of economic uh, of Africa. Abuja, Nigeria, and he'll be talking about accelerated education programs, uh, scaling strategies in Nigeria. And then we will have uh, the last presentation will be coming from Diana Ofori. And we'll, Diana will be looking at um, lessons learned in scaling up of accelerated education programs in Sierra Leone. So basically, we're going to focus on the three uh, West African countries, that is Ghana, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone. And then there will be a plenary discussion. We'll have a, a session for question and answers. This will be led by my colleague, uh, Marianne. Marianne is the team lead, Kicks Africa 19 Hub. And then we'll have closing remarks at the end, uh, which will be done by Ricardo. I hope I pronounce your name correctly. Ricardo Sebates. Uh, Professor Ricardo Sebates of Education and International Development Steering Committee. So um, we have Eunice Bolza, 
Eunice is going to be the moderator for today. And uh, we really do hope that we will keep to time. We'll request that uh, for the speakers, please have your video on when you're speaking so that you give a human face uh, to the listeners. And also uh, we'll, we ask that uh, when we get to the Q&A section, uh, you be keen to take notes of questions that are directed to you. Thank you. Uh, over to Eunice. Welcome, Eunice. Thank you very much, Yvonne, for the introduction. Once again, you're all welcome to today's webinar. We'll be learning some lessons from using an evidence-based approach to scaling up AEPs. So we'll be hearing from Ghana, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone on the research being done on accelerated education programs. So just as Yvonne said, kindly use the chat box, introduce yourself, let us know where you're coming from, your organization. Please let us try to mute ourselves as much as possible so there'll be no interruptions. Okay. So to kick start, we would like to have Dr. Leslie to give us a presentation on some strategies for scaling up AEPs in Africa. Over to you, Dr. Leslie. It will be, it'll be uh, uh, like, it will be too, too ugly or bad and very, very disappointing if or uh, an LLF as I call it. Yes. Yeah. So it will be bad that they will come. Hello, will can we all mute ourselves, please? Um, good thank morning, you. everyone, and thank you so much for ch joining us at today's webinar. I, I specifically want to thank. So I do as, what, what, what saying that if I would like to um, thank especially UNESCO and the GPE Kicks team that has been helping us to um, conduct the research in West Africa. Yeah, sure. You should have been in the minute so we can ask you some questions. How can people? Sorry, I think someone will have to mute them. They'll have to mute them. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So friends, um, thanks again for joining us for this webinar today. Um, we've got three presenters as discussed and it's based on the research we've been conducting in West Africa for the last um, four years in Sierra Leone, Ghana and Nigeria. What we've been doing is measuring the effectiveness and impact and, and, and economic um, effectiveness of AEPs, Accelerated Education Programming in those three countries. I'm just trying to get to my next slide. Okay, so the main objective for the KICS research in West Africa was to investigate the impact and increasing access to learning for children who are out of school through measuring the efficiency and effectiveness of um, accelerated education it, especially in relation to gender equality. So we were looking at especially the impact it was having on girls and boys differentially. Um, we were generating the evidence base and building on the existing evidence base, which is quite significant in countries like Ghana, but less um, so in places like Sierra Leone and Nigeria. We were also trying to build capacity of governments to adopt and scale up these approaches that had already been um, evidence-based, but that we were strengthening the evidence base as moving forward. Our research partners were ourselves, Associates for Change, the Center for the Studies of African Economies in Nigeria, and Dan Dalon Consult in Sierra Leone. But we also had many other research collaborators, including the ones that I've mentioned in this slide here, uh, the education innovators that were scaling up themselves in their own districts and states, Save the Children Fund, Sierra Leone's BRAC, and then we had the Ministry of Education in Sierra Leone also having some innovations that have been trialed through COVID and through um, Ebola. We also had very strong innovators in Northern Ghana, School for Life, Gilbit, and um, in Northern Northeast Nigeria, Horn of Hope and Corno Borno. Our partners were very much embedded in the ministries of education, civil society, coalition movements, the Brookings Institute, UNESCO, UNICEF, and others. And as has been mentioned, we had an international steering committee made of, up of experts from um, 
Carleton University, the Real Center at the University of Cambridge, and others. I just want us to remind ourselves of some of the models that have been trialed in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa over the two last two decades. And many of you I know are experts in accelerated education. You've been piloting and trying to go to scale in areas, um, for instance, in, in Ethiopia and Burkina Faso, we have a very good models of speed schools, which condense the six years of primary into three years of, um, of, of of, for, of formal primary education. It's a condensed model. It's also focused on foundation learning. The second model we'll be looking at in these three countries and our investigations have shown is the complementary basic education model, which is also considered an AEP in cases of Nigeria and Ghana, which is one year of um, you know complementary education, which is using usually a mother tongue approach. And then we have the girls impact models that have an additional um, income generation component to it. So it, apart from the literacy, numeracy, foundation literacy, these models have been showing. Dr. Leslie, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Can. Okay. So we have over 250 million um, kids on the continent, children on the continent out of school, of which 40% are in West Africa. Um, the, the main reason that we want to see scalability in these countries and some of the strategies that we've been using uh, relate to the country context where it, the a, accelerated education has very much been a development partner, donor-driven activity until the last five years six years where we see more and more government involvement through policy making and strengthening the environment in which um, accelerated education programmings are working so in nigeria sierra leone and ghana we the government has been putting in place policies legislation that you'll hear from some of the speakers and also um financing to some degree um how did it work and what are the most significant success stories uh, we found that the governments were increasing their awareness of the importance of accelerated education in terms of uh, a modality to address out of school children, but where it fall, fell um, weak was in the area of financing, which you'll hear from the cases of Ghana, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone. Um, we, we had a methodology to the scaling research that we were using. It was embedded in the Brookings Institute's ROSI collaboration under the GP Kicks project, and most of the countries will present on their uh, research in relation to the scaling research we had as part of our longitudinal studies. So the scaling strategies that worked best for us in the three country context was to strengthen and embed the scaling research as part of the longitudinal impact study. And that meant creating the enabling environment and selecting key thematic areas for the first few years of the research. We started off with a mapping exercise of the number of out of school children in each country. We measured the financial obligations and commitments that were needed in, in terms of the government's commitments needed to scale down the number of out of school children. And then we provided this evidence at strategic points the UN Transforming Education Conference that was held in 2022, IDRC annual events, as well as the Accelerated Education Working Group annual events, especially those that were held in Nigeria and, and Ghana and other places. Uh, moving forward, we also realized in the research that it wasn't at national level alone that was necessary to create an enabling environment. We needed this at the meso and micro levels at community level so that districts could identify the capacity building potential that NGO coalitions could get on board with the evidence and that the local government initiatives could start to uh, collaborate with traditional leaders and communities to scale up their endeavors. Um, our products are available on our website. You can see some of the products that were generated over the last four years to provide the evidence for scaling. And um, as I mentioned, we had to be strategic in the selection of what we were presenting to governments and to other. Um, the, finally, just this last slide, I'd like to mention that the uptake 
of this type of scaling events resulted in um, some of the ministerial agencies like the Complementary Education Agency and the Ministry of Education in Ghana using the evidence in their annual reports and their planning, um, their planning documentation, and, and most importantly, in the programming that we're putting on the ground to scale up the program in the Ghana um, case. In Sierra Leone, to final, just to come to Sierra Leone, is, is that we had a really great uptake in the UN conference on transforming education, where the chief executive officer presented the data to the minister. And at that time, the minister uh, was able to allocate and, and, and focus some of the uh, core financing coming in from Qatar Foundation and the World Bank towards scaling up um, uh, accelerated education in Sierra Leone. So those are a few examples and we'll come in uh, more in a few minutes, but I just like to say um, a big thank you to UNESCO for giving us this opportunity. The results are on the platform and I'll come back at the end of the um, other three presentations. Thanks again. Over to you, Eunice. Thank you very much, Dr. Leslie, for giving us insights into some of the scaling strategies being employed in West Africa. Moving on, would like to hear from the keynote speaker in the person of Dr. Osom, who is the Director of Social Mobilization at the Universal Basic Education Commission in Nigeria. Dr. Osom, you have the floor. Okay, I think Dr. Osom is not yet in, so would we'll proceed to the presentations. So we'll be having three presentations from Ghana, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone. And the first to take this presentation is Dr. James Natia Adam. So Dr. James Natia Adam is the senior research lead at Associates for Change and he'll be presenting on Ghana's framework for tackling the rising numbers of out of school children. So Dr. James, over to you. Dr. James, you are muted. We still can't hear you. Kindly unmute yourself. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, so Eunice, thank you for having me. My name is James Nati Adam. I am the senior research lead for this IDRC research project. I will be presenting on the topic government of Ghana's framework for tackling the rising out of school challenge. Lessons learned in scaling up complementary basic education, implementation, and financing. The outline of my presentation will include a brief introduction, the government of Ghana's framework, the complementary basic education implementation, the scaling up complementary basic ed education implementation, the financing of complementary basic education, the lessons learned, conclusions, and the way forward. By way of brief introduction, over the years, there have been a rising number of out of school children from about 1 million in Sierra Leone to nearly 20 million in Nigeria. There are several factors that account for this. These include poverty, limiting socioeconomic and cultural factors, as well as inequity in the distribution of the national resources. However, there has been unanimous acclamation that addressing the out of school children or challenges has potential benefits for national development. This includes human capital development, reducing inequity and poverty, making informed health choices, as well as achieving the sustainable development goals, particularly goal 4.1. There are several strategies that developing countries employ to address the out of school challenge. In the case of Ghana, there are several policy interventions. 
This includes the complementary basic education, the free compulsory basic universal basic education, early childhood education, school feeding program, capitation grants, amongst others. Within the context of this framework, there are other legal frameworks that support these policies to enhance inclusivity and accessibility to education. For instance, Article 25.1 of the 1992 Constitution of Ghana emphasizes free compulsory universal basic education. We also have the Education Act 2008, and that is Act 778, which lays the bedrock for education interventions across the length and breadth of the country. We also have the Complementary Education Agency Act 2020, Act 1055, which prepares the groundwork for the edu complementary education agencies to implement strategies and programs that will address the rising out of school challenge, among other things. Prior to these interventions and the work, and beyond that, there have been constant partnership and collaboration between the government and amongst other donors, non-governmental organizations, and communities that all aim at addressing this out of school challenge. In recent times, the complementary basic education implementation has its primary objective of improving quality access to quality education for children who never attended school or have dropped out of school before completing the primary education. Indeed, the complementary basic education program targets children who are between eight to 16 years, mostly located in rural, extreme poverty and underserved regions. There are several strategies that these programs bring on board. For example, it is, it is community-based education intervention that ensures that local facilitators or facilitators are amongst the local people who understand the cultural dynamics of the learners. Besides that, the program is run in the local language and understands the context of individual learning differences. In the case of Ghana, there have been several interventions that have, that have been employed to enhance complementary basic education. Whilst it started as an intervention in few districts in Northern Ghana by some non-governmental organizations, there has been expansion of complementary basic education by the complementary education agency across all regions of Ghana. Indeed, it was first supported by donors, speci specifically USAID crown agents, among others. And then by government's policies and legal interventions, we now have several non-governmental organizations that are partnering the state to run CBE programs. And currently what we are seeing is the formal integration of the complementary basic education graduates into the formal education system. Indeed, from this institutionalized position within, within Ghana, we have the complementary education agency that has been integrated formally into the Ministry of Education's framework for operation. And currently we have about 2,000 staff across the length and breadth of the country. Despite these legal and policy interventions, the complementary education agency still faces some peculiar challenges. These include inadequate resource allocations and logistical challenges. In terms of finance of complementary basic education, the government of Ghana has allocated about 1% of the education's budget for the complementary education agency to work towards reducing the rising number of out of school population in Ghana. Available evidence suggests that we have about 1.4 million children who are out of school. In some cases, it is 1.2, depending on the variables that have been added up to some of the complement to some of the number of people who are out of school. Indeed, studies by Associates for Change suggest that currently Ghana needs about 150 million to target 250 children over the next six years in order to reduce the out of school challenge by 50%, which is a presidential commitment that was made by the current president of Ghana two years ago. We've seen that studies also have also indicated that only about 6 million allocations can target about 20 million about 20,000 children across the country in 2024. I will come back to this figure shortly. However, the support from international donors and then the non-governmental organizations suggests that their intervention is contributing to about 80% of CB graduates 
having achieved foundational literacy and numeracy skills. One of the prominent outcomes of this intervention is that learning achievements, especially literacy and numeracy, is almost at par with the formal education with children who, are, who were on, enrolled into the formal system at class three or class four within a year of nine months of intensive education or training. An innovative financial strategy among the communities has been uh, the contributions from the communities through the provision of some grains, which are subsequently converted into cash to compensate for the efforts of the local facilitators across the country. In fact, this chart you see, or table you see here, shows that in 2024, the government of Ghana is proposing, especially the complementary education agency, is proposing about 12.5 million USD to target our 250,000 children who are out of school in order to be able to bring or reduce the number of children out of school by half. But what we see currently is that less than 0.01% of the allocation is given to the complementary education agency, which is woefully inadequate to address the rising number of out of school children that we currently face. The chart, in this chart, we see that the allocation for 2023 was about uh, the government, the actual location was about 2.1 million, which represents 25%, which means that the investment in addressing the out of school challenge is woefully inadequate. Studies have shown that per a cost, that it costs about 559 Ghana City, which is an equivalent of 50 USD as at December 2023, to educate um, a graduate from the complementary education, education agency into the formal system. The results of governments creating an enabling environment to scale up CBE are prominent. First, there's national awareness of the second pathway for attaining foundational literacy and numeracy by providing children with complementary basic education. Secondly, there's enormous and strengthened government machinery and ownership in responding to the out of school challenge. This government machinery creates an environment that enables curricular development, assessment, and transition of the CBE graduates into the basic education system. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, the, the framework, the framework enables various non-governmental organizations to work consistently across the communities with a view of addressing the out of school children. Furthermore, there has been new partnerships that have been developed for investment by governments, by potential donors, and by other private sector actors, including the community-based organizations. However, what is left for us is to strengthen the mechanisms for state and non-state relationships in order to enhance delivery mechanisms, particularly for children who are located in the extreme poverty and hard to reach areas. The evidence from our IDLC supported research suggests that there's capacity that is within the communities to sustain the complementary basic education programming if and even and when donor funding is not available or where it, become, where it becomes insufficient. There's also the recognition that local government authorities have in recent times recognized the rising out of school challenge and want solutions for investment. Indeed, our recent evidence sharing workshops carried across Northern Ghana suggest that the communities are well galvanized to support, community, to support the government and also own up their own mechanisms of addressing the out of school challenge. And this they do by contributing their media resources to support the local facilitators to continue to render their services at a cheaper price. Indeed, our research plays a key role, especially in tracking those um, the out of school children or the CBE graduates who are not into the formal system. Our research has been able to track these learners up to the senior high school level. And so therefore, the constant monitoring and evaluation, which is lacking in terms of tracking this system, has been fulfilled by our research. What is more important for us is that our evidence has been able to prove that it is cost effective to, to, to train CBA graduates. If you compare the figures of training a formal a student in the formal system, it is about 1,057 Ghana CD which is an equivalent of 93 Ghana cities as of December 2023, per people or child. If you just suppose that figure with the AEP cost, it is about 816, which is an equivalent of 71 Ghana cities, $71 as of December 2023, 
for learners to transition into the formal system at class three or class four. The key points to carry away is that there's a need to develop an enabling environment which is there, which is currently existing, but it is to be enhanced, especially the policy and the legal framework for action. Indeed, there's a recognition that civil society plays a critical role in monitoring government financing commitment towards CBE and in order to address the after school challenge. Therefore, what we need currently is to, is to identify champions of change in the policy arena, especially getting the reform secretariat and then other relevant stakeholders to come out measures that can uh, help us identify um, champions of change within the communities to um, help us carry on with this uh, project and other initiatives. The finally, what is important is that our evidence sharing, hard traction and uptake at local government level, especially at districts such as, such as the Kumbugu district in Northern Ghana, where we engage with not only the meso level government actors like the regional um, stakeholder, decentralized stakeholder, uh, stakeholders, but also community level and district level, which are recognized as micro level implementation of decentralization policies. Finally, there's space, more space for um, collaboration between researchers, civil society, and education stakeholders to plan effectively for the outdoor school um, challenge to be addressed holistically. And therefore, there's a, there's a pathway that we see that CBA is a, CBA is a pathway for sustaining and enhancing efforts that will address the outdoor school children that we currently face. The way forward include that. Based on our research evidence, we suggest that we should enhance collaboration between government, non-governmental organizations, and communities to better inform us about the challenges that we that the challenges that we rural poor people face in terms of their education, so that when we collectively collaborate, we can generate evidence that is going to be useful for uh, better uh, decision making by policymakers to to develop policies that will address this high number of after school children. And finally, there's a need for us to ensure that sustainable financing models are put in place by state and non-state actors to continue to support local facilitators to move on with their uh, services of um, achieving a zero um, out of school population in rural context. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. James for these valuable lessons. Thank you for sharing how the government of Ghana is trying to scale up AEPs using the framework. Thank you so, so much. Just a reminder, if you have questions, feel free to use the chat box. During the questions and answers time, Marianne will take us through. Thank you. Our next presentation will be done by Mr. Kashima Bahago. He's a researcher at the Center for the Study of Economies of Africa in Abuja, Nigeria. So Mr. Bahago will be presenting on scaling strategies in Nigeria's conflict zones, focusing on the implementation pathways of education innovators and the government. Over to you, Mr. Bahago. Um, good day, everyone. Good day. Yeah, so like Eunice has earlier said, um, my name is Bahago Kashima. I'm a researcher at the Center for the Study of the Economies of Africa. So I'll be running through um, um, lessons learned on scalability in um, Nigeria. Well, I lost touch of my screen. Okay, trying to, what did I touch? Uh, permit me to reshare this again. Um, I'm trying to see my screen. Hello, Bahago. Do you need any assistance? Um, I get okay. Let me see. 
Okay, this is fine. We are good, right? So, yeah. uh, sorry for the today. Um, okay, that's fine. So, I'll be running through the um, the the lessons learned on scalability in the Nigerian case. So, um, the presentation will start by introducing um, um, the subject matter on AEPs. And then we'll look at the research objectives, the methodologies, the key research findings on EEPs in Nigeria, specifically that we've done in the past four years, as well as also looking at the lessons learned on scaling EEPs in Nigeria. So I'll start by introducing us to the data backing um, the need and the relevance of these projects in West Africa and then in Nigeria to be specific. So according to UNESCO, um, about 244 million children are out of school and um, children and youth are, are out of school with 98 million of them located in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then according to the Brookings, um, we also discovered that about 40% of these out of school children are in West Africa, you know, with 35% in East Africa, 13% in Central Africa, 10% in Southern Africa, and then 3% in North Africa. So this shows, shows a justification as to the relevance and importance of these projects in making ev efforts towards addressing the numbers of out of school children in West Africa. And then this, this, this millions of children in West Africa are denied opportunities to attend school due to poverty, conflict, cultural practices, and inadequate educational infrastructures. And then we also discovered that um, AEPs are heavily um, do not driven you know um so that's like an overarching perspective to um my presentation today now the key research objectives um in this presentation is to investigate the elements that contribute to the successful scaling of eeps in nigeria and then also examine the challenges encountered during the scaling process of eeps and then understand the rules of relevant stakeholders you know in driving the scaling of AEPs in Nigeria. So the methodology we, we used in the course of scaling is the common learning questions approach. And then the ROSI, the ROSI is research on scaling the impact of innovation in education, which was developed by the Brookings Institute. And the, and then the common learning question promotes collaborative inquiry and critical thinking amongst multiple stakeholders in, in an attempt to, to scale AEPs. So um, going by the key findings, you know, from um, our research in the past four years, we discovered um, that um, the numbers of out of school children in Nigeria, meanwhile, the the study in Nigeria is focused on Bruno states to be specific, you know, even though we had other parts of the studies that looked at the federal, federal government um, contribution towards addressing the numbers of out of school children. We also saw that EEPs have been significantly effective in Nigeria with um, um, personal and community impact looking at the fact that, looking at the transition rates of um, AP beneficiaries being high by up to like 70%, which also impact on the gender, looking at gender perspective based on cultural attributes, you know, affecting um, the girl child in Northern Nigeria. We also discovered financial and logistics, logistical um, challenges um, faced by um, AP beneficiaries due to insufficient 
um, financial resources or support by their parents and guidance and also limited um, learning space and also um, scholastic materials, basically. We also saw that um, AEP beneficiaries were equipped with relevant skills and knowledge for them to be able to transition into higher levels as well as also utilizing these skills um, in the world of work for those that could not continue you know, with school. We also discovered that um, EEP beneficiaries were effective in the, in the, in the sense that um, the learning outcomes, you know, in terms of uh, literacy and numeracy were at par with um, non EEP beneficiaries. And then we also try to look at the the cost, the cost associated with not investing in in AEPs in order to reduce the numbers of out of school children in in Nigeria. So this um this chart kind um depicts um um the earlier narrative saying that the um, EEP beneficiaries um, are performing as good as non-EEP beneficiaries in terms of learning outcomes. So this table looks at um, English literacy. We can see that um, the differences in terms of initial letter reading, word reading, paragraph, and story, story reading, there is no much difference in terms of um, the percentage, you know, um, in terms of learning outcomes, and we can see at some levels, um, EEP beneficiaries are performing better than um, non-EEP beneficiaries. And then at some of these levels, we can also see that um, non-EEP beneficiaries are performing better than um, EEP beneficiaries. So that was, that was for English um, literacy. So this for numeracy to also see um, learning outcomes in terms of of numbers, we can also see that there are no much differences in terms of um, 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 this, this outcomes, basically. So going further to highlight the cost of not investing in um, education, we can see, we, we discovered from the literature that there are monetary costs and there are non-monetary costs associated with not investing in um, in EEPs, you know, in order to reduce the numbers of out of school children. So on the monetary side, um, the cost, the cost associated with not investing in in EEPs will lead to um higher life and um, will lead to lower lifetime earnings, you know, and then lower um GDP, you know, if if um, the government doesn't invest, and then other other non-monetary um costs associated with lower lower healthcare, um, um, high crime rates, and then less less participation in civic activities, you know, and then um some key lessons learned in the course of scaling in Nigeria, we discovered that the Nigerian government has demonstrated support you know, through curriculum development in partnership with um, um, development partners. And this has been instrumental in helping to mainstream EEPs into formal school, you know, after, after the periods of intervention. And then other um, government facilities were provided for, for, for the implementers to be able to um, carry out these interventions. Then of recent, we also saw that the federal government of Nigeria set up an institution called the National Commission of Almagery and Out of School Children um, in, in order to drive um, the implementation to be able to um, support um, non-formal education in order to drive the numbers of out of school children. However, there are limited res there are limited resources allocated to this institution to be able to actually make the desired change, you know. And then um, we also discovered that um, stakeholders at the community level are really enthusiastic 
in terms of um, the intervention because of the impact it has made to the beneficiaries and the community at large. We also discovered, so we also learned that government at national levels um, need to do more in terms of supporting and um, complementing some incentives provided from the federal government to be able to actually drive um, and address this issue because we discovered that most of this, um, most, most of the of the out of school children are actually positioned in subnational levels and they should not leave all the effort to the federal government. They need to actually complement in terms of um, contributing some budget lines from their internally generated revenue to be able to actually address um, some of these um, challenges. And then stakeholders at the community level face financial and resource constraints in scaling accelerated education program despite their interest and their enthusiasm in 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 um in supporting and then addressing this issue. So there are also some nexus between the evidence that we've generated so far and then um impact in terms of scaling. Um, in Nigeria. So we have so far um, disseminated, organized um, dissemination events at community, subnational, subnational and the federal levels in terms of um, our findings from all of our research outputs, including the political economic analysis around this intervention, the effectiveness study, the costing study, the social economic costing, around EEPs, you know, in order to inform all relevant stakeholders to be able to get everyone on deck. And then there's currently an effort being made um, in collaboration to support the Bruno in Ananda State um, um, in terms of them tapping into an, an initiative called an open schooling initiative developed by the federal government of Nigeria in terms of matching grants, you know, so they will need to have to bring a, a certain percentage from their internal generated revenue to be able to access that fund from the federal government in order to actually support these issues. We also, um, in terms of um, knowledge sharing, collaboration and making impact. We've brought in, um, during our high level conference, we brought in Bruno State and Niger State, you know, at the high level conference in Ghana in June, in order to um, further share our evidence and then deepen um, the impact, you know, of um, lessons learned in order to make impact in those states. And then, um, Policy consultations were also made with um, the Accelerated Education Working Group in Nigeria, bringing all stakeholders, you know, to ensure that, that um, our evidence makes desirable impact in addressing numbers of household school children in Nigeria. So in conclusion, AEP is an, is an in education in innovation with significant potentials of addressing out of school challenge in sub-Saharan Africa. And we've seen that in terms of learning outcomes, you know, increasing access rates, you know, um, education access. And then also we've seen how effective EEPs have been in terms of um, transition and retention of, of EEPs in schools. and as well as the impact in terms of stories of change for those that could not continue the way they used um, their literacy and numeracy skills in, in the world of work. And then um, we also, um, another concluding um, point is that education innovators um, supported um, donor agencies in collaborations with the community, you know, in order to implement these um, interventions. However, more efforts from the from, from, 
from a broader regional um, governmental um, institutions would be fundamental in driving this, such as the African Union and then other government um, ownership, you know, in order to drive, um, to address these issues. Then to successfully scale and sustain EEPs, a collaborative effort is required at all levels, like the state government, federal government, and also uh, um, the international community at large in order to um, address um, these issues. So um, the federal government, so the, po the policy recommendation will be that the federal government should take full ownership of addressing the out of school challenge in Nigeria. This is very simple period of time, you know, and then is an opportunity for the government to be able to see pick up the lessons learned from those interventions and then take ownership of um of um this initiative in order to actually um improve the state of um the country. Then the subnational levels should allocate a portion of its matching grant provided by the federal government to fund EEP. So meaning that all stakeholders are are fundamental in driving this. So we should not just this should, some national government should should also take ownership and complement the efforts made by made by the federal government in order to address um, these societal issues. And then disseminating evidence locally at all levels is fundamental in informing um um and policies we can see from from our political economic analysis we saw that at the initial stage um there was no drive by policymakers in order to actually um um invest in this but we can see of recent that um the dissemination and enlightenment um events have made significant efforts that we can see that in nigeria we're able to develop a an AAP curriculum, and now we just got an institution, you know, to be able to drive this. And then resource allocation is very fundamental for um at the community level because we discovered that they are the most enthusiastic, you know, in terms of sustaining this, but they lack um, um re adequate resources to be able to actually um, um make the desired um, impact in terms of scaling of the Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bahago, for this great presentation. Thank you for sharing the link between evidence and then the scaling of AEPs. Indeed, to scale up and sustain AEPs, it needs to be a collaborative effort from all stakeholders, the government, the community, and then the whole society, civil society. So thank you so much for this presentation. We'll have our final presentation by Ms. Dinah Ofori Owusu, who works with the Land Development Consultants in Sierra Leone. So she will be discussing lessons learned in scaling AEPs in Sierra Leone. Over to you, Madam Dinah. Thank you, Eunice. <laughs> My name is Dinah Ofori Owusu, and I'm sharing lessons learned for scaling up AEPs in Sierra Leone. Experience from government and non-state actors. Dana, we can't see your screen. Mm -hmm. Are you trying to share? Oh, okay. One second. Can you see now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So as I've, I've said, I'm sharing lessons learned for scaling up AEPs in Sierra Leone from the government perspective and non-state actors. 
One second. <laughs> So many. They on, but you know they what, sound they come on. Not to the sound, you know they move. Light control. Okay. Would you want me to share from my end? Yes, please do because. Okay. Okay, can you see? Yes, I can. Ah, thank you, Eunice. Go to the next slide, please. Ah, so this presentation is divided into the preamble, government's efforts to tackle the out of school situation in Sierra Leone, types of AEPs identified in Sierra Leone, Lessons learned to inform scaling of AEP programs and then Sierra Leone government's readiness to scale up AEPs. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next one. Sierra Leone, like other countries, has its own share of out of school children. Please go back. And these have been followed by. Can you please go back, Eunice? Uh -huh. Poverty, gender discrimination, long distances to school, as, as well as lack of education uh, schools in most of the parts of the country, especially the rural areas. And then there's also the negative social norms and practices. Next slide. So in addition to COVID-19, that uh, was experienced by a lot of countries globally. Sierra Leone had the unfortunate situation of also going through the Ebola virus disease, which increased teenage pregnancy from 30 to 65% because schools were out of session for one full year. And this affected children's ability to go to school and therefore increasing the number of out of school children. Yes, next. Next slide. So the government of Sierra Leone has ratified most of the international and regional treaties that guarantee uh, universal access to education. And even <laughs> locally that, and has also uh, promulgated, promulgated policies that ensure that children, there'll be universal access to education. For instance, the Education Act 2004 prescribes the duties of parents, guardians, and then government ministries to ensure that the out-of-school children's situation is reduced. But then this has not worked. And so the next available option is the out-of-school accelerated education program. Next. Through the IDRC research, we came across three types of AEPs in Sierra Leone, the catch-up model, or which came about as a result of the COVID, uh, Ebola outbreak and the fact that government had banned pregnant girls and young mothers from going to school. So the Ministry of Education put together community learning centers. As we speak, it is still ongoing and we have 23,079 children who have graduated this year and are entering the mainstream education this September. They provide usually provide remediation for these girls who have dropped out of school. And then we also have the accelerated education program spearheaded by Save the Children, which took place between 2016 and 2020. <laughs> they collapsed six years of 
primary school education into three years to provide rapid education. And then we also have the ELA or Empowerment and Livelihood for Adolescents program by Brax Yalun, which provides vocational studies for children who are out of school. Next slide. So we have, <clears throat> out of our studies, we have found out that uh, we are going to share 10 lessons under three domains, that's enabling environment, delivery, and then finance. Next. So under enabling environment, the first lesson we learned was that in order for there to be improved AEP learning, to uh, improving AAP learning to skill, we have to have a favorable policy environment, committed political, champ uh, political champions and community leadership. Next. So the nation, uh, Sierra Leone, the country of Sierra Leone had already put uh, plans in place. So we had a Sierra Leone National Development Plan, which tries to give equal rights to children in Sierra Leone for education, to access education. Then we have the free school, quality school education, which removed the school fee barrier in 2018. It is still ongoing. The government also attend the ban on pregnant girls from attending school, which was started in 2020. And then we have the National Policy on Radical Inclusion, which prioritizes strategies to address the needs of marginalized children, including children who are, preg are pregnant, children with disabilities, those from poor homes, as well as parent learners. Then we have the National Out of School Strategy, which was developed in 2022. Then, and then we also set, as a, a part of our IDRC research, we set up a policy learning working group, which was embraced by the, this, uh, the Minister of Education. So when we come to competitive leadership, what we did was, to find a champion in the Ministry of Education, who was the technical, technical head of the Ministry of Education as a chief education officer. So she rallied her team around us and then supported us throughout. So for instance, when we put together a policy learning working group, the Ministry of Education was chair and then co-chair. Then the second lesson that we learned was that availability of research findings also try, helps in convincing policy makers to give policy makers on the importance of repositioning AAPs. For instance, the IDRC Kids Project gave a lot of evidence to the Ministry of Education that convinced them that it is important that they support the accelerated education programs in Sierra Leone. That we have them uh, enabling environment again. We have district councils, willingness to include AAPs as part of their annual budgets. So the, because we have been sharing these uh, uh, evidence, the district councils are also convinced that it is important that they support the accelerated education programs. And then we also have communities demonstrating capacity and willingness to contribute to accelerated education program. For instance, during the, our studies, we found out that the communities provided training centers for the accelerated education programs. They also identified children who were out of school and also try, uh, ensured that they enrolled in the program. Then they also ensured that children who enrolled in the program com complied. So they had local laws to support this. And then through our policy, through our research, we also find out that the programs the community members are willing to contribute to village savings and loan schemes to ensure that AEPs continue working. Next. Next. So under an, another lesson that we learned under enabling environment is empowering parents to ensure that there's scalability. So when parents are giving some kind of trade or money to loans to engage in businesses, they are able to support their children after the, they have completed AEP so that they survive the, uh, the regular school. And then we also have capacity building of teachers 
contributing to sustainability and scalability. So we found out that it's important that teachers at the local level have their capacities enhanced so that at any point in time, they will be available to lend support to the AEPs. And, not, and then of course, we know that they have to also apply, supply them with some kind of incentives. Then we come to the method of delivery. That's another lesson, that broad lesson that we learned. And that we have a flexible learner-centered approach is key for diversity and inclusion. We find out that most of these AEP uh, beneficiaries are, have come from different backgrounds. We have children with disabilities, pregnant girls, older learners, parent learners, as well as learners from remote areas. AEPs should be able to ensure that they cater for all these diverse needs not in order to succeed. Then we also had uh, dialogues with AEP beneficiaries where we found out that facilitators' patience is a key, key factor in ensuring that AEPs flourish. And then also their method of teaching, uh, combining songs and dance as well as play-based learning, ensure that they uh, get the attention of learners. And also the facilitators' attitude in terms of looking at the children, the beneficiaries as their own children and provided, providing advice where necessary is also very good in ensuring that children stay in the AAP programs. Next. Next. Next slide. Uh -huh. Then we have, and that method of delivery again, we have tested AAP designs deliver quality learning. So we, in addition to doing research, we also have to test the ability of the children. How are they performing in relation to children who are in regular, regular school? We found out that their performance was at par with children who had had six years of studies. These promising results convinced the Ministry of Education to also support the AEPs. Next. So under finance, we found out that most of these AAP programs are donor dependent. And so they come to an end when donor funding gets uh, finishes. So it's important that um, to ensure that the program continues, it's important that for as long as there are out of school children existing, there should be funds available to ensure that they are supported to gain either further education or to learn some trade. Next. And then the tenth lesson under finance is that the AAP programs provided support to children to uh, join the regular school. For instance, after the AAP program, they provided school bags, shoes, and uniform uniforms to ensure that children, when they go to school, are able to stay because these are some of the challenges that they face. Even though there's free education, parents are unable to support their children with these other school materials. And that is where the challenge is, and which is the cause of some of the children dropping out. Then we also found out that students who are trained on income generation during the AEPs are able to sustain their, themselves in school because they are able to gain some money from the trade that they do in order to support them in school, to provide the, their materials, teaching and learning materials. Then we come to Sierra Leone government's readiness to scale up AEPs. Yes. So recently, this year, the Ministry of Basic and Senior Secondary Education has launched its first national guidelines on accelerated education with the object objective of providing benchmarks and criteria to be used by AEP service providers in order to ensure that they provide a equitable and inclusive education for all children who are out of school. And then, so to, to ensure that, to, uh, to show the AEPs, the ministries, Ministry of Education's support to the AEPs, the Chief Education Officer and then the 
director in cha charge of formal education, also joined the team in Accra for the high level conference and they made significant inputs into the AEP program. Next. So we also have, uh, so through the evidence that was shared with the Ministry of Education, the, uh, the ministry also used this as supporting documents in uh, looking for funds for the from the Qatar Foundation. And money has been provided both by the Qatar Foundation and the World Bank and to support 120,000 school children, ages to 12 years to gain education, to, uh, to continue their education. This is a five-year program. Next. Then we also found out that the government of Sierra Leone is willing to collaborate with organizations that are already in the AEP program to ensure that Sierra Leonean children gain education or the children who are out of school gain education. So for instance, so, uh, save the children and then the, some other NGOs are playing an important role in co uh, collaborating with government to ensure that the objectives of the Qatar Fund program is a clear, is, is realized. Thank you. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Madam Diana. This was really insightful and eye-opening. It's good to know that the government of Sierra Leone is doing so much to promote AEPs and also their collaboration with um, NGOs is also really laudable. Thank you so much for your presentation. We'll be moving on to the questions and answers session. And to take us through the questions and answers or the questions in the chat box, we have Marianne. So I'll hand over to Marianne to do that. You can still keep typing all your questions in the chat box, they will be addressed. Thank you. Hi, Marianne, you are muted. She said you should unmute her. Okay. Yes, thank you. Now I'm unmuted. Thank you. I wasn't able to unmute myself. If the host has disabled that function. Um, thank you so much, Eunice, and thank you so much to the presenters who have spoken so far. Um, I'm just I myself am, am absorbing the, the richness of the presentations and trying to take notes here and there on, on what has been shown to be cost effective and um, uh, otherwise effective in terms of numeracy and literacy standards, et cetera. So we're, we're having some questions coming in from the chat box and I would encourage everyone here to continue asking those questions um, to make it more uh, discussion-based. Um, maybe what we can do is just go um, uh, with the first one that has come out. Um, it was during the first presentation uh, with Dr. James and someone is asking, Samuel is asking um, to, if, if, if we could elaborate on what is the transition and learning continuity um, of the out of school children? How, how exactly is it organized in Ghana? So there's a question about, you know, getting some more details about um, how it's organized. Um, should we perhaps, You appear to be muted. I can't hear you, please. Marianne, are you there? Yes, can you hear me now? For some reason, yes. someone keeps muting me. Yes, please. Okay, okay, sorry. For some reason, I was muted again. 
Um, okay, so I think uh, I just wanted to say thank you for the questions that are coming in. Please, if you could continue asking the questions, um, everyone who's here today, because this is where the, the strength of the discussion will lie, is what kind of questions um, uh, that we're asking. So we have a few questions, and I, I'm just going to group them together. There have been um, some questions. Um, so I'll, I'll first uh, begin with, um, with the gender and equity and inclusion standpoint, because that is something that we try to mainstream in everything that we do. There have been some questions, such as from uh, Dorothy, uh, Moena as well, from two participants at least, on what has been the makeup or the percentage so far of, um, of girl learners and learners and youth with uh, disabilities in the program. Um, I think there's some interest, if there's any data on that, on how many of them are, are, are girl students and how many of them are learners with disabilities. Um, so I think that question may be addressed to, to the speakers that spoke about um, uh, the, the AEPs specifically. And if I could also pose a question about um, what would it be like so what is the, how is, how are, o, how are the programs actually organized in Ghana at, um, I think the question was for Dr. James initially. So if we could begin with those two questions, how was the transition and learning continuity organized and what is the makeup of the female learners and learners with disabilities and the AEPs? Over to you, Eunice, thank you. Okay, so Dr. James, can you please come in on this? Very well, thank you, Eunice. Um, the question is, what is the learning organized, the learning of APs organized in Ghana? Am I right? Yeah. Is that it? Yes. Okay, good. So, AEPs are what we call as related education programs are designed to provide educational opportunities for outer school children who have either never attended school or dropped out of school before completing um, basic education. In the rural context, many of these programs are run by the non-governmental organization sector. And these classes are organized oftentimes during the evening where the facilitator and the learners gather around under a tree or sometimes they use existing infrastructure in the community, such as mosques, such as church, and then if there are formal education structures existing in the community, these facilities are sometimes utilized for the AEP programs. It is open up for both male and female, whether disabled or people with different forms of disability are allowed to participate in these programs. Learning is often done within the most spoken local language of the community or of the people. And so uh, it's a blend of both um, the, the local language and sometimes just minor, minor, minor lit, lit, um, lit, lit, uh, English is used, minor, in the sense that some of the uh, instructions like um, numeracy, instructions are not well developed in the local language. For example, one plus one or in the division aspect. So the, 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 the language for division, multiplication and subtractions are not well contextualized within the local language. So sometimes the facilitators utilize the English words to support learning in these communities. And so uh, after a period of nine months, learners are then transitioned into the formal system, either at Primary three or primary four. Right. So, in brief, that is how the AEP learning takes place at the community level. I hope I've been able to address the question. And if the, the questioner still has more questions directed at me, he can uh, he or she can send me a private chat or an email for further discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. James. Would Dr. Leslie also like to come in on this to share some insights? Thank you, Dr. James and, and Eunice. Just a, a quick one then, just to um, reiterate a few of the points that Dr. James has mentioned, that it's, a, it's usually a nine-month program that is done outside the rainy season. 
So children are still working on their farms in the morning with their families. They're still engaging in labor activities in their communities, but they're able to engage in the afternoon for three hours from two to five in a localized community setting. And it's 25 learners usually. In the case of Nigeria, I think it's a little larger than 25 learners. And the gender targets by most development partners are 55% women, girls. So in every 25 children that are in the class, there has to be at least 13 or 14 girls to hit the targets for both um, the donors as well as the government. They have these affirmative um, equity targets. Um, in some cases, it's all girls. In the last few years, we've had donor support for, in Ghana's case, um, all girls programs that required about 20,000 girls were in them and there were no boys in, included in those programs because of the issues around extreme poverty and intergenerational poverty. Um, trying to escape that, we found that it's important to target some of the AEP programs solely on girls. In Northeast Nigeria as well, because there's conflict and girls are being placed back into the communities, in some cases, they're facing um, a lot of abuse and, and they have uh, the AEP programs um, prepare them from a psychosocial perspective. So there are very strong gender targets in most of these um, programs. And as Dr. James has mentioned, mother tongue is the main language used. It's also minority languages. So in Ghana's case, there's 12 official languages, but then we've the program has added four extra marginalized um, community languages that are for a population of about five to 10,000 people. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leslie. So we move on to the next question. This is going to the Nigeria team. So Mr. Baha will get ready. It says, I want to know what is Nigerian government doing to enhance or mitigate the out of school children challenge in terms of availability of technology and access to qualitative education through online platforms? Is there any data to justify this? Over to you, Bahagun. Hello, Bahago, are you there? Okay, we can move on to the next question, which says, can we also have details on how accelerated learning is implemented that differs from what happens in the formal classrooms? I think this was um, highlighted a lot in the Sierra Leone presentation. So we can start with Madame Diana. Can you give oh, us some yes. details as to... Sorry, I was I was muted. I couldn't unmute. Oh. But I'm now mute. Yeah. Okay, so I'm so um, sorry. Can you can you repeat the question again, please? Okay. Um, Christopher wants to know what is the gov the government of Nigeria doing to enhance or mitigate the out of school children challenge in terms of availability of technology and access to qualitative. Or oh, I mean, quality education. Yeah, I think that is what he means. Quality education through online platforms. And is there any data to justify this? Okay, so I, um, I'll start by saying um, the government has been making um, efforts in terms of addressing numbers of out-of-school children. And um, from our political economic analysis, we can see that... Um, um, policy makers at the federal level are now better informed on the relevance of, of interventions such as EEPs in, as, as a pathway to reducing the numbers of out-of-school children. That is one, right? Then the second one is the fact, like I explained, I explained in my slide, is the establishment of the National Nigerian Commission 
of Almagerian Art of Sculpture, which is an institution, you know, established to drive, you know, the process of reducing these numbers of Art of School children. That is that is an effort made by government, and some some resources have been allocated to this institution to be able to drive this. Then in terms of online platforms, I can't specifically um, um, see anything specifically in terms of technology deployed for addressing out of school children, but I'm aware of um, of interventions being done by government by setting up um, tech tech related um, institutions, you know, across Nigeria because um, there's a study we did for Mastercard on ed ed, 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 ed tech that is education technology and there are centers that have been marked in the six geopolitical zones in Nigeria in order to you know bring in technology into education going based on the um the aftermath of covid and everything but i can't specifically see how that ties to out of school children but i know that there are interventions being done to increase technological penetration in the education sector in nigeria yeah so that's what i have to say in terms of addressing that question Thank you. Thank you very much, Bahago. So we'll move on to the next question, which was asking about how different the AEP lessons or classrooms are from the formal classroom. So Madam Dina, can you take us through that? And then we move on to um, a question I missed, which said, what model was used to engage AEP learners in income generating activities. So they need more details. Dorothy needs more details as to how this was implemented. So we start <laughs> with Madame Dana and then we move to Dr. James, and then Dr. Leslie. Okay, thank you, Eunice. So the in the case of Sierra Leone, yes, children, every child who has to go to junior secondary school has to do uh, undertake the national primary school education. So there's no way any child can avoid that. So what the AEPs do is to, uh, like for instance, um, say the children has collapsed the six years education into three, which is based on the national uh, curriculum. So what they do is to train the children in such a way that they are able to pass the exams. And I think for um, say the children, over eighty percent of the children pass the national primary school examination in order to go to GSS. And then for <coughs> the Ministry of Education's MOPAP program, they specifically give remediation to children who have dropped out of school because of some kind of problem or other. That's girls, and so they also train them to go through the national curriculum. And then when they pass, they enter formal education. So that's where the link is. They are trained to go to that uh, through that pathway. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Thank you. Diana. So let's look at the case of Nigeria and then Ghana. What are some of the means by which they are trained on um, how to generate income? Okay, so I will speak for, for Ghana. The AP or CB learners, uh, in addition to the acquisition of uh, foundational learning in numeracy and literacy, are also trained on life skills, on employable skills, because the pathways from the AEP or the CBE are one, to transition into the formal system, and two, to transition into the world of work. And so those who transition directly into the, into the world of work acquire in addition to the basic or the foundational uh, literacy and numeracy, acquire other skills, employable skills or vocational and technical skills that enable them to move on into the world of work, especially those who are coming from 
extreme poor backgrounds and find integrating into the formal system very difficult. So what are some of these life skills programs that uh, the education innovators undertake or perform for these AEP um, beneficiaries? One includes weaving, others include um, how to prepare or make basic detergents like soap making and other things that they can easily sell within their locality in order to generate income. So apart from the usual learning, they also have hands-on experience with life skills that will make them employable after they leave the program. And so those who are able to transition into the formal system come along with some life skills that enable them to, to integrate learning with some skills that aim them income or livelihood after the normal classes. The last point I want to add is that because the AEP or the CB classes are flexible, learners are allowed to come in with their, if they were um, cattle shepherds, they were allowed to bring animals to graze around the learning centers. So this means that the AEP is serving a dual purpose. One is that it allows the AEP benefit learner to learn alongside having a close watch of his or her cattle or sheep or goats sometimes attended around the classrooms. So that kind of flexibility provides an upper hand or opportunity that those who are in the former system, to some extent, are not able to execute this dual role in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. James. Bahago, would you like to come in on this? OK, so. Um... In, in the case of Nigeria, um, it's not so far from um, what um, Dr. James had highlighted. Um, the core skills is the literacy and numeracy skills, you know, which um, was embedded in the in the in the curriculum, you know, which uh, we can see that um, was instrumental in helping them in the world of work. Um, there were other vocational skills that were embedded in the curriculum too, because we discovered that most of them were from not too well-to-do homes, and they needed some um, form of um, income-generating um, skills to be able to um, support their families and also enable them to be able to transition further into um, higher levels of education. So um, that is what it is. It's mainly the literacy and numeracy skills to be able to com communicate, make um, 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 elementary calculations, to be able to communicate, and then they were able to have some vocational skills like sewing and um, whatnot that will help them as life skills as they transition. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bahago. We'll move on to the next question Hi. from... Hello, Eunice. Hi, Diana. Sierra so Leone also had this uh, vocational skills training. That was organized, uh, undertaken by BRAC, where children go through literacy and numeracy. And then they, they also are given some trade like soap making, uh, dress making, uh, sometimes even agriculture. So all these, so interestingly, uh, black uh, beneficiaries were not supposed to, it was not geared towards uh, sending them to formal education, but it will interest you to note that when uh, uh, we did, an, uh, when we went through, did the research, we found out that a lot of them have gone back to formal school and those skills that were, they were trained on was supporting them to remain in school. That's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Diana. So Regina says she's currently conducting research on ABs in Tanzania at the secondary school level. And she has questions about how students are assessed in terms of being able to return to formal school. So can any of our presenters address this question? How are the students, the AEP beneficiaries, assessed in terms of being able to return to formal school? What is the assessment criteria?
Uh, should I speak? Yes, I think please go ahead. I mentioned this already because in Sierra Leone, you cannot enter junior secondary school without going to the national primary school education. And so children, uh, those who benefit from these AP programs are taken through that path. And so by the time they finish, they are able to write those exams and then they, they proceed to, to go to that level of education. Without that, you cannot enter secondary school at all. So I think for Tanzania, what the AEPs need to do is to try to also gear their, their educational system, to, uh, their programs towards the national education curriculum so that the children, who, after they have gone through the AEP programs, will be able to transition to the formal school. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. James, would you like to speak for Ghana? Yes, please. Let's speak okay. one. So um, the main requirements, entry requirements into the senior high school is to pass the basic education certificate examination, which is often conducted by WAIC, that's the West African um, Examination Council. So, um, after graduating or completing the AEP program, the learners are formally integrated into the formal system at class three, and then can climb the academic ladder till they get to um, the junior high school three, where they write the DECE. And when they pass, they roll into the senior high school. But at the senior high school level, we have two forms, those who go direct into the technical and vocational school, and those who mainstream into the, the uh, English or the arts courses program. And so um, the basic entry requirement is to pass these exams. Unlike in the case of Sierra Leone, where um, the AEP learners can be examined at a different level uh, for which they can enroll or move straight into the senior high school level, that kind of system does not operate here in Ghana. Our recent studies conducted by AFC Associates for Change indicates that we have about um, five to 10% of AP learners across um, the senior high schools, especially those located in Northern Ghana. That includes those in TVET, that's the technical and vocational schools, and those in the formal um, education system. And so these are the entering points for AP learners at the uh, senior, high schools, senior high school level in Ghana. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. James. Bahago, would you like to tell us about the case of Nigeria in terms of the assessment criteria for AEP beneficiaries who are transitioning into formal school? Uh, I'm always struggling to unmute. Sorry okay, so that. it's... Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually the same thing. Um, it's a standard, basically, you know. Um, it's similar to, it's the same thing in the Nigerian, in the Ghana and Sierra Leone case, knowing that there's a, there's a national standard, you know, an entry point into um, senior high school. And then this intervention is to, you know, package the education yeah, literacy yeah. skills. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. we can. Okay, is to so this this nine months period of intervention is to package the literacy and numeracy skills, you know, to a, to the AAP beneficiaries to be able to actually pass through the national standard, you know, of entry into sec secondary schools. Basically, thank you. Thank you, thank you to all our presenters. Thank you very much. The next question is on funding. So Joshua is asking, he says, securing long-term funding within country budgets is certainly one critical factor in achieving scaling of AEPs. What I'm not seeing is how to help systems ensure that sustained quality of an AEP as it scales. What can the speakers say about measures to consolidate capacity and commitment of systems to train, supervise, and support AEP teachers to ensure that APs are managed effectively? This is quite a packed question, but 
um, we'll try to answer it. Yes, yeah, so he says, um, what can the speakers say about measures to consolidate capacity and commitment of systems to train, supervise, and support AEP teachers or facilitators to ensure that AEPs are managed effectively, that MS efforts to capture them, and so on. So um, can any of the speakers answer this question? Okay, so since my presentation um, had a component that centered on funding of AEPs, I will attempt to answer that question. Yeah, so the, the research highlighted the mechanisms through which um, sustainable funding of AEP programs can be, can be made or achieved. The first critical one was the top-down approach, which is where donors and the government provide the resources for accelerated education programs. But we realize that this kind of mechanism is not sustainable. So therefore, the approach now is to, is to tackle the, the sustainability of funding through the community level, what we call the bottom-up approach. Over the last two and a half years, we have conducted studies that indicate that communities are owing up and are prepared and willing to contribute their resources in the form of um, um, the, in the form of an alonka of that is a bowl of um, grains for local leaders to convert that into cash. And this cash is now uh, used to motivate the local facilitators. Indeed, in some of the communities that we visited in Northern Ghana, the local facilitators are now taking up distance learning programs to the University of Cape Coast, the University for Development Studies, and the University of Winneba, where they undertake um, education-related programs just to build their capacity and to enable them to facilitate and then uh, impart knowledge and skills for those who are out of school in Northern Ghana. The, what we are currently um, uh, advocating, even though that's not our mandate, is to see if the reintroduction of the, the UTTT program the and train teacher program can be put on board to enable these local facilitators to apply formal skills in terms of how to prepare lesson notes, how to deliver lessons, and uh, become abreast with current trends in educational development, as well as curriculum that's been uh, run or used by the, the uh, complementary education agencies. So these are the mechanisms through which the communities facilitate, um, and, facilitate and help local facilitators to build their skills, as well as how the communities contribute their own quota to sustain the stipends that are given to these uh, local facilitators. So the critical point is that the bottom-up approach appears to be sustainable, appears to be uh, forthcoming, so that where there is donor fatigue, then it suggests to us that the community are owing up and then funding AEP for the rest of their programs. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. James. That's really comprehensive and helpful. I can see a lot of discussions going on in the chat box. I see Professor Ricardo typing a lot. Thank you so much for giving us your contributions. Thank you. So um, we'll be wrapping up with the questions and answers session very soon. But there's one question from Temi Dury Alesh. Sorry for that pronunciation. But he is asking, could you please describe a concrete example of how AEPs are run? Are students enrolled in cohorts or can they enroll on an individual basis? So this is a general question and I would want each of the speakers to come in on this briefly. Thank you. Mahago, can you start? Okay, yes, I can start. So um, so from our research from the field, we discovered that um, there's no particular um, um, cohort, as, as it were, in terms of um, enrollments, because we see that it's the responsibility of the community leaders to sensitize parents and guidance in the community on the relevance of allowing their children to be able to participate, you know, in this um, um, in AEPs. 
right? So there's no particular cohort as it were, because we find out that there is a certain amount of people that we start at a specific period, but they won't return for one reason or the other, and they need to be replaced. But one core thing in terms of your question is the fact that there's a certain number of children that has to be a particular class, a particular but there is no specific, you know, in terms of cohort, you know, because what we are trying to do is try to see how we can get as many children to pass through this intervention as much as possible with the aim of actually reducing the numbers of out of school children. And that's how it starts from sensitizing their parents and guidance to actually relieve them to go rather than join them in doing house chores or going to the farm or whatnot. Thank you. Thank you, Bahango. Madam Daina, can you come in on this? Yes, for the <clears throat> Ministry of Education's catch-up model, we see that they engage different uh, girls at different levels who might have dropped out for one or two reasons, either by pregnancy or cause of pregnancy or any other situation. So what they do is to get all these children at different levels, primary school, secondary school. So and then <clears throat> during the training, they, they are specific on where uh, they train them according to where they would, uh, I mean, their performance. So for instance, if the children are able to perform, those who are able to perform at the uh, secondary school level, or let's say JSS level are sent to JSS and those at uh, perform at the primary school level go to that level. And then also secondary school, senior secondary school are also uh, uh, prepared to go to that level. But for the say the children, it was basically geared towards primary school education. I mean, completing the national primary school education exam to in order to uh, join the JSS. So I think that's all I can say. I don't know whether anybody else has something to add. Okay, thank you, Madam Dina. Please, if any of the participants has a question, you can raise your hand and then I call you to ask your question. I see. Um, His Excellency Gilbert, Gilbert's hand up. I also see Miriam's hand up. So let's go with um, His Excellency Gilbert first, and then Miriam will follow. So kindly unmute yourself and then ask your question. Please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good morning. It's yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Oh, oh. Good evening, okay. depending on where okay. you are. Is there uh, is Excellency uh, Mr. Gilbert Etimbi, uh, Peace Ambassador? It's a very very pleasure for me to assist in this meeting. It's a une grande joie pour moi de vivre ce moment là avec vous pour pouvoir donner un peu. Uh, Comme nos constats et aussi des rapports concernant nos activités en tant que philanthrope, en tant qu'ambassadeur pour la paix et la lutte contre les souffrances en Afrique et surtout sur ce point de l'éducation en Afrique. Et c'est très important, ça nous tient beaucoup à cœur. Et pour nous, c'est un grand privilège pour nous de partager ce temps-là avec vous. Voilà, cela fait depuis plus de 20 ans que nous œuvrons dans l'humanitaire, au secours de nos populations africaines en détresse et défavorisées, surtout les couches défavorisées. Et il y a eu plusieurs années où nous avons eu à scolariser beaucoup d'élèves, 2000, 3000 jusqu'à 5000 élèves à fonds propres. Depuis plus de 20 ans, nous œuvrons pour cela. Et pour nous, être à cette grande vitrine internationale et mondiale de, de l'UNESCO, pour pouvoir parler vraiment des souffrances de nos populations, de nos familles et surtout de l'enfance est quelque chose qui nous caractérise et qui nous tient beaucoup à cœur. Donc, euh, veillez vraiment euh, et manifester votre écoute à notre endroit parce que nous sommes ici, nous sommes comme des témoins oculaires de ce que vivent nos populations 
défavorisé surtout parce qu'il faut le noter. Euh, C'est vrai que ici, nous pouvons encourager euh, le gouvernement ivoirien par rapport à l'école parce qu'aujourd'hui, nous pouvons voir dans beaucoup de villages une école, deux écoles. C'est vrai que c'est insuffisant et c'est là aussi que nous entrons en action parce que c'est vrai qu'il peut y avoir l'école. Euh, il faut les moyens pour que ces enfants-là euh, puissent vraiment aller à l'école et c'est ce qui manque beaucoup. Et c'est ça un peu le problème que nous constatons sur le terrain. Et vous trouvez des mamans veuves, abandonnées, rejetées. Vous trouvez des parents totalement démunis, des personnes désœuvrées, des parents qui ont perdu soit le travail, d'autres qui sont dans la vieillesse, avec des enfants qui sont à l'âge de, de partir à l'école. Mais les parents n'ont pas de Excuse me, Excuse me, We don't have a okay. translator, so we'd appreciate okay. if you type it in the chat box and then we'll translate it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, madam, I am, I am there. I am there, madam. Okay. 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 Okay, okay. okay so kindly translate it. Okay. We are running out of time, so please. Um, okay, okay, madam. His Excellency Etimi Gilbert is an ambassador of peace and fighting against suffering in Africa. So he's trying to talk about uh, education of uh, in, in Africa, uh, since uh, 20 years, he is supporting families, poor families in Africa. He is saying that everything is not uh, good, but in Ivory Coast, uh, there are things changing. He is inviting philanthropists to support government, to support poor family. It's very important because this is what he's doing as an ambassador and as philanthropist since 20 years. Vraiment, c'est ce combat que nous menons depuis okay. des années. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, His Excellency Gilbert. We are running out of time, so we'll pause with the questions for now, but we'll try to answer them after the webinar. I see Mr. Kofima for asking if we couldn't answer his question. We'll get back okay, to you on this. Okay. So, um, quickly, we'll move on to having some remarks and observations and recommendations from Professor Ricardo Sabates. He's an international development and um, education professor at Real Center, Cambridge University. So um, over to you, Professor Ricardo. We'd like to hear your observations, recommendations, and remarks. Thank you. Professor Ricardo, are you there? Yeah, I was just waiting for the permission to be unmuted. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much and good afternoon. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to join you uh, from the University of Sussex, where we're having an international conference here on uh, education and with many people, uh, colleagues here from around the globe and the global south presenting uh, research that has continued to help us to understand more the issues around education. And thank you for your brilliant contributions. Uh, in terms of some of the issues that we have discussed here, and the most important uh, thing to say is that there is a lot of evidence about what works uh, and what is an African innovation. I think the experiences of complementary basic education, as well as those experiences that we have from African innovators in uh, Sierra Leone and Nigeria, demonstrate the effectiveness of these programs in helping the out-of-school population. And there's been many, many studies, some of which I have been uh, honored and having the pleasure to collaborate and learn from some of the, the lessons about these programs, how in a relatively short period of time, learners are able to uh, achieve foundational skills. They're able also to build uh, skills on uh, different life skills and also some employability skills. There are different models. We have uh, earlier here uh, uh, attendance from the speed school programs in, in Ethiopia and other accelerated learning. 
So I agree with some of the comments that have been said about what what works in Africa and what is what are these African innovators doing. Uh, the challenge here is to continue to identify some of these African innovators uh, and and the principles in which they've been uh, working and these principles that make the interventions to be effective. Uh, some of the principles are well known: the fact that they need to be done in local language uh, and that they have to be. Uh, done by local facilitators. And more and more, we're trying to understand the role of the facilitator, a facilitator that is somebody that knows the community, engages with the community, is a, a role model, a mentor. And it and, and as has been put here in some of the comments, they're incredibly committed to their communities. And in fact, many of these programs, particularly the ones that are really embedded in their communities, when there is funding cuts, they continue to do it uh, with funding on a shoestring. In fact, for some of the cases that we have followed, we know that when international funding has been uh, dropped or reduced due to the COVID pandemic, it's really the, the local African innovators that are remaining in their communities committed to continuing these programs, and that is important to, to highlight. But this research that we heard today is really taking us in the direction of where the, some of the gaps are, and the gaps are in the scalability, the scalability of the programs and working with the governments. So ultimately, to reach the numbers that we have, is really the government that has the capacity to do it. So these three presentations that we have heard, they're really outlining the most important issues that have been emerging from the three cases where government is coming along board in planning their policies, in some cases is still in the, in the policy and the high level uh, statements of intent of the government to be able to, to put all their efforts into accelerated education programs. And in others is the government already taking action and implementing and what the research is showing us here is how, in some cases, we're even going further in understanding how communities and the different stakeholders are willing to embed themselves and, and make these programs work. So I think that some of the uh, questions that remain is really around how the government is able to adopt and adapt and what are the elements of adoption and adapt adaptation that the government is able to take on accelerated education and how they can continue to be embedded into the formal systems to, to support the learning of children in communities, particularly through the, all the mapping exercises that have been done by this incredibly uh, talented uh, consortium of researchers in terms of what is happening in the communities, uh, particularly the ones who have very, very few educational resources being uh, uh, provided by the government. So I'm aware of the time and I would like to now stop here and, and give uh, Dr. Leslie uh, or Eunice back to you again. And thank you very much for allowing me just to provide a few of these thoughts, but thank you all the participants. It's been an incredible session and your comments have been just fantastic. Eunice, over to you. Thank you so much, Professor Ricardo, for these observations and recommendations, highlighting the gaps and the need for the government to do more. We'll move on to the final item on the agenda, which is the conclusion or the concluding remarks and the next steps. And to do this, we have the Director of Associates for Change, Dr. Leslie Kingsley Hayford. She is the West Africa team leader for this research on accelerated education programs. Over to you, Dr. Leslie. Thank you, Eunice, and thank you, um, Professor Ricardo, and all the speakers that have um, contributed today from Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and Ghana. It was a very rich presentation. Um, going forward and in conclusion, I think the communique from the high level conference in June spells out the next steps for African governments. It's been a long time since dedicated resources are put to the question of out of school children. And I think that we're at a stage now, the communique iterated in June with Mali, Burkina Faso, Ghana, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone's um, top level policymakers reiterating the need for dedicated 5% of basic education devoted to out of school children using accelerated education programming and other modalities to ensure that those children transition into primary education or other types of pathways, vocational training and what have you. 
it's also the the communique which is on our website also iterates the need for governments to accept community volunteer teachers after having dedicated three or four years to accelerated education into training colleges where needed so that they can become permanent teachers in their localities. Those permanent teachers will become more accessible to the children that are all, already in primary school because they're from their communities, they speak their local language, and they've committed themselves to the education pathway for the last three to four years as volunteers. Um, we've also seen the need for their training to be sustained, and the government has some modalities in place, but I think at the local government level, there needs to be a strengthening of teacher training through colleges of education for accelerated education. Um, finally, I think the pathway through TVET has to be improved, and that conclusion comes out of most of the countries where Children are being transitioned in the formal academic systems of primary, junior, and even senior high school in the case of Nigeria. But um, we need a pathway that's easier, that's more accessible for accelerated education um, graduates to go into TVET, into technical vocational and training after they complete their, their um, programs. So again, I just want to thank everyone. A lot of the conclusions from this seminar, as well as from other research we've done, is on our website. And um, Eunice will be circulating to the participants through UNESCO the, um, the links to the policy briefs and to the reports that we've written based on the tracker studies, and most importantly, the communique from the high-level conference in June. I want to thank everybody for their participation and UNESCO for giving us this opportunity to work with you. Um, we're hoping finally that the AU does put in place, the Africa Union does put in place a committee to fully investigate and support accelerated education in the next CESA, the Continental Education Strategic Plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Leslie, for the concluding remarks. I would hand over to, to Yvonne now. But first of all, I'd like to thank all our presenters and all participants for joining. Thank you for the engaging questions you posed to us. We are sorry we couldn't answer all the questions, but I've noted them down and then we'll be contacting you to answer them. Please forgive us. Yvonne, are thank you, you there? so much, Eunice. Thank you to all the presenters. We really appreciate you taking time to come and share with us. I've learned a lot. I believe everyone else has also learned a lot, uh, judging from the comments and the questions that I'm seeing, and also the requests for follow-up sessions. Uh, it, uh, it was really a great session, and thank you. For those whose questions were not uh, able to be answered today, do not worry. We'll compile them will give answers and we'll be emailing them to you. Also, I will share the recording of this uh, session and also the PowerPoints. Uh, thank you, everyone. I don't know whether Victoria is still here, but if not, sorry. <laughs> then um, maybe Marianne can officially uh, end the session. Is Victoria still here? Okay. My apologies, I have a cough. Marianne, please over to you. Thank you so much, Yvonne, for, um, for wrapping us up. I just want to um, sincerely thank everyone. I don't have a whole lot additional to say. I think that you've said it uh, well, but I want to thank everyone for coming and for, and for having this conversation today. As you can see, two hours is clearly not enough time. We definitely need more time. So um, as Yvonne said, we're collecting all the questions and we'll find the best way to address them going forward. Um, I want to sincerely thank uh, all the presenters today. Um, I want to sincerely thank everybody for coming out for this discussion. And uh, we hope to see you at the next webinar. Um, please take a moment to tell us how today went. The, the link is in the chat box. And um, you are now all part of our um, invitation list for our future webinars. Um, we'll be sharing a link to our next learning 
uh, opportunities very soon. So thank you on behalf of UNESCO ICPA and the GPE Kicks Africa 19 Hub and have a wonderful day. Thank you, SM to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you.